that's important in the uh, overall is the idea of art as a kind of therapy. I mean, it seems to me the very beginning you have, or at the very end of the first part, you have, um, is it Max? Is that his yes. name? Yeah. Max um, broken up about his girlfriend leaving and somehow getting into the part of someone who's also having a lot of grief. Um, and it seems like that that's a kind of um, a partial theme that's kind of work, working through. And in other words, the rela and it's, which is partly saying the relation of art to life, uh, which becomes, you know, it's very funny because I've, 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 you could disagree with me about this, but I think that to me, America may be the only country in the world that actually hates art. <laughs> uh, and, not, and for illogical reasons, I mean, basically <laughs> associating art with upper class snobbery, yeah. with, you know, like cappuccino, I don't know, it's like <laughs> Greek, you know, it's like somehow it's part of all that and it's something to be contemptuous of. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, you know, you feel that contempt even in your film because it's, I mean, it seems to me that the whole thing about May Ray is a certain contempt for art. There is, um, you know, when I was in France showing the movie, they talk about that particular attitude about America towards art, that uh, as if it were a new kind of recent uh, phenomenon. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was another uh, gentleman from France. You know, you read it in Tocqueville. He puts yeah. his finger pretty clearly on the pulse of how much, in general, the American populace does not care about art. And it's... Um, and to, so, so to some degree, I do think that's true. I think, but at the same time, you have such original artists emerging. From America has, <laughs> is great in terms of what it's produced in terms of art. That's yeah. what's sort of a paradoxical about exactly. this. Exactly. And then what you were, and I'm glad you really brought up, you know, we can, we can sit here and talk about art as this, um, you know, quite abstract and interesting thing. But I like that the banner of art is not where the first film ends. It doesn't end in this, you know, at the board meeting where we're arguing about the role of art. Yeah. It ends in this very practical thing where you could even say, it doesn't matter what the art is, it can fall away. Yeah. What's important is it's a means by which Dorothea can take care of Max. Yeah. It's a mean by which a means by which Max can step out of himself and express himself at the same time. So it's a vehicle in other yeah. words. Yeah. And and you know, we have many of those for yeah. helping us you know work through our complications um, I do think art is a very powerful and versatile one um, and maybe in an age where we don't have some of those other tools it becomes even more important well something else that intrigues me a lot about a bread factory is the fact that there's a lot of emphasis on the very young and the very old mm -hmm. at the very beginning and at the end also it's uh and I'm curious about why or if you have a feeling or thought about why there is that emphasis. I, um, maybe a way to, it's almost a flippant way to talk about it, but um, it may be that I'm just not particularly biased against those particular ages, that a lot of our stories do concentrate on the middle. Um, another way to think about it is, I remember I, I think my mental age kind of vacillates between six and 60 a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and my, the people I connect with tend to be around those ages. And a friend of mine, um, you know, once observed, he's like, that's great. You skipped all the bullshit years. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, one of the weirdest things about it is, you know, like the disappearance of Jan, which never gets explained. It's, uh, it's almost like you could say La Ventura. <laughs> uh, but it's but but plus the fact that it allows for a newspaper run by little boys, which is also very unusual, um, and I think one of the th games that at least to me one of the kinds of conversations that take place between part one and part two is what what is realism? You know, it's like uh, because we accept most of part one as realistic in a certain kind of way. But what's going on in part two is just as real. The events are just as real. Yeah. So the uh, it becomes a little kind of uh, well, as I say, a very a very interesting kind of 
unresolved conversation in a way. Yeah, and in you know when I when I directed theater, I I started in realism just because it's a little easier to get your groundings um, and learn, um, and then then you're very then you understand very well each departure from realism, and. This was really satisfying because usually you have to go from project to project to be able to use these different techniques and, and, and forms of expression. And I did like that we, could, we can have them all, not quite in one, but in one project and in two pieces. Well, did, did you have a production of Hecuba before you made this film? I was working on a radio production yeah. of it. And uh, so it was in my head and I had gotten to the point that I was you know, casting and, and thinking about... Um, the play a lot, uh, but it um, it didn't quite fall immediately into the center the way you know you there's no nothing natural about the form. It's a it's a four hour comedy that ends with half an hour of Hecuba, <laughs> you know, it's, and uh, I think it started as one of these tangential things. So um, you know you have the poet coming, you have the filmmaker coming. Oh, they would do this little rehearsal of Hecuba on the side. Um, but as I was selecting the sections, and, and it, it, it keeps going, I, I watch the film again, and words from it resonate uh, with the main stories in Bread Factory more and more. And so that's why it became more and more central. Well, sure. I mean, I think that's part of, uh, that's part of what you share with Jacques Rivette, the idea, the relation between theater and life, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and, about, and, and also because both theater and life are involved with performance of different kinds. But which leads me to another question, though, is um, how many of the actors were professionals and how many were non-professionals? Or, or what was the ratio in terms of... It was... That's a little harder to say. I would say almost all of them were some kind of professional with different yeah. degrees of experience. Um, how it broke down is we had two casting directors, and I would say that about 60% of the casting was local. Um, and then 40% was out of New York. Yeah. Uh, there was, but you know, it ran the gamut. So sometimes you think of, and it is a little easier for, at least for me, I know some directors work really well with lead actors that don't have much experience. For me, the, I like working with those actors for smaller roles, for a line or two here or there. And then I really loved working with um, the, the actress Elizabeth Henry, who plays Greta, is, um, you know, she, she has been working a lot, um, but it's been... She, she lived near Hudson, and a lot of her work was in theater in the area. And to me, it is, I like that. My, a lot of my, you know, reason for wanting to do Hecuba at the end is also to express that, you know, wonderful art happens in small towns. Extraordinary artists exist in small towns. Mm -hmm. And she, it was nice that she is right in line with that spirit. Right. Uh, I'm sure there some of you have some questions too. So, right here. yes. A uh, question. Um, I was really impressed by the performance of not only Miss Henry, but a lot of the performances. But Tyne Bailey, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand she has won the Tony Award and six Emmy Awards. And she's a very familiar uh, face. There must be. I was wondering a story about her being in your film. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, it's a bittersweet story in that um, we have a mutual friend, uh, Brian Murray, who plays Sir Walter in the film. Um, the, the bitter part of it is he's since passed away. Uh, but he was in my first film. Uh, we, beca we had been friends for a number of years. Uh, I met Tyne through him, and uh, she was a wonderful fit for the character, but also just you know, there aren't many people who are that accomplished, as, as you described, and can fit a low-budget production like this, you know, but she, she never complained, and she set a beautiful example for the rest of the cast, and was always helping the rest of the cast. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, yes, back there. Um, first, I want to say thank you for offering characters who are over 60 and they're not doing veiny bullshit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Skydiving or you know, like Betty White kind of stuff. That everybody so thanks for that. Um, um, I really like this, this relationship um, between the people in this town where they're sort of grudgingly dependent on each other. You know, that it's like that village, you know, that it takes a village kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they, they 
it's sort of, they adapt to it, but they're not crazy about it. And that seemed very realistic to me. You know, the way those, the way those interactions happen, the way those relationships happen. Yeah, I, th I think it's an underrated force in what is very nice about these small towns is that you can't have an incident and then it lives in somehow in isolation with the rest of your lives to follow. You can't avoid these people for long. Um, I, and it makes you behave a little differently and maybe it, it leads you to some sort of resolution that you might otherwise have, you might otherwise not have had. For example, with Pat and Dorothea, um, if they didn't have to multi interact in these multiple ways, I think they're finding a piece, uh, which I think is, is one of, for me, one of the more mo moving parts of, uh, of the film, uh, might not have happened in a bigger town.